All right, hi everybody. Thank you for coming. My name is Mary Warby. Uh, I am head of a, of a team called Design Transformation at the Global Bank uh, BBVA. And Design Transformation, you've probably never heard of, of that kind of a team because it didn't exist until about two years ago. We, we made it up. And our role in the bank is to be transformers, literally. And we are working bring design beyond the design team and out into the organization. And as Alan said this morning, you can apply design to small things or to very, very large things. So in this case, we're applying design to make the entire organization more innovative, more customer-centered, and more responsive. So today's agenda, we're going to talk a little bit about the business case for design. You've already heard quite a bit of it this morning, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go through that pretty fast, and then we're going to walk you through what we think is an alternative paradigm to change management from from what you might be familiar with, and that's because we're basically we're practicing backward thinking as uh, thinking from the back, as Alan said this morning. And that really tends to flip paradigms. We're going to go through that, and then we're going to conclude with a little bit of discussion around how you can take these ideas and start to influence your own organizations. So who here has heard of BBVA? OK, that's pretty good. Uh, <laughs> uh, we are a global bank based in Spain. We have 132,000 employees mostly in 13 countries, but we're really in about 25 countries. And we've been around for 160 years. So when you think about the rapid pace of technological change, BBVA has a lot of legacy. Not just legacy technology, but legacy practices, processes, structures, ideas. And when we came in a few years ago, we looked around and we said we need to change this. In order for BBVA to be competitive, because the banking world is changing very, very quickly. Can we just <laughs> can't turn my head. Better? Better? OK. Better? Better? All right, yeah. So three years ago, BBBA was just starting out on the design road, like many of you may be today. And we had a handful of designers, less than six. Today, we have above 200 around uh, in seven or eight countries on the global design team. So in two years, we've gone light years. Now, we also have 1,100 of these guys. And we call them design ambassadors. What they really are is they're design thinking hybrids. They're people like you who are non-designers who we have put through training and coaching and mentoring in order to supplement what you or they already do to give you essentially an extra toolkit in your practice. So I want to show you a quick video. To do that, I have to jump out of here. So, uh, and this is about our design ambassador. que esta metodología nos puede generar una ventaja competitiva para posicionarnos dentro del mercado de una manera diferente, innovadora y acercándonos al cliente. Escuchar al cliente, escuchar qué es lo que te van a decir y esas soluciones podrían generar mayor impacto. Design thinking is a proven methodology for solving complex problems creatively and collaboratively. We put the user at the center of our thinking and we keep them there throughout the process. Y he visto aplicar design thinking a infinidad de situaciones, desde problemas socioeconómicos en países en vías de desarrollo, problemas complejos en organizaciones, hasta planificar las vacaciones de la familia. Supone un cambio que enfoca la transformación digital, pero sobre todo a pensar de una forma innovadora y a cambiar las reglas del juego cuando estamos pensando en los productos y servicios que generamos. All 140,000 of us are making decisions that impact the customer experience. 
Often, we're not thinking about it in those ways. So what the Design Ambassadors Program aims to do is create more clarity and more focus on the customer so that we're all thinking about the customer every time we make a decision. La finalidad de este programa es que todos los empleados de BBVA compartamos una misma forma de trabajar y lenguaje, posibilitando la colaboración entre países, equipos y disciplinas para ofrecer soluciones de valor a nuestros clientes. With the Design Thinking for Leaders program, we're addressing organizational change from two directions, top down as well as bottom up. And it's essential to have the backing of our senior leadership and middle managers to empower employees to work in new ways. Creo que el design thinking puede realmente poner a BBVA en lugares donde creo que ni tan solo el banco se imagina. Lo que va a permitir es que podamos crear productos innovadores y a tiempo. Hola, queremos sorprender al cliente, queremos darle la vuelta a eso y creo que empezando por trabajar de esta manera podemos algún día llegar a estar en esa posición. Enseñar a diseñar en equipo y que la construcción colectiva hace que se generen mejores ideas y planes de verdad reales para implementar. Gente que está cambiando su posición y su rol porque sencillamente con su nuevo set de herramientas es capaz de hacer cosas nuevas y esto creo que poco a poco va a ir generando muchísimos cambios y cambios a mejor dentro de la organización. Os animo a todos a que os forméis en esta disciplina, que aprendáis sus técnicas y que las apliquéis en la resolución de los problemas de vuestro día a día para que así tengamos éxito en nuestra transformación. Okay, so that guy at the end, uh, sorry about the Spanish. Uh, my Spanish isn't that good, so I was the only English speaker in the, in the video, but, uh, but I don't know if you noticed, but the guy at the end was our CEO of the entire BBVA group. So design has gone all the way to the top of BBVA in a matter of two and a half years. Now I want to ask, I want to turn the lens on you guys for one second and ask, what about your companies? Are there any designers here today? Awesome, okay, we've got some designers. Uh, I'm curious, ask yourself these questions because we're going to come back to this at the end. How many people in your company? And then, How many people on your design team? And that's going to give you an interesting ratio. I was, I was kind of bragging, okay, we've got 200 designers now at BBVA. We have 132,000 employees. So we're tiny. We're super tiny. And many of you may be in a similar situation where you have a very small design team and a very, very large organization. And the question is, how can you start to take that design team and go beyond its numbers and really create impact of design throughout your organization. So keep these in mind. We're going to come back to that later. Now, an even more important question is, where are you on the spectrum? So here, design can live in many places. Now, maybe you use design purely as production, it's visual design and The engineers or the business people put together the, the screens, the applications, the ideas for the products and services. They hand it off to a designer and they say, make this look pretty. You might be there. Or maybe number two, design starts to, starts to take hold and you have a few end-to-end -end projects that really start to prove the value of design. Now somebody this morning in Alan's talk asked an interesting question. What do you do if they don't want to work this way? And that's very, very common, and we face it all the time. And we say, hey, okay, see you later. And then we go and we work with the people who want to work with us. And a little while later, those projects start to have impact. And people notice, and then those skeptics, they come back. And they say, hey, now we want to work with you guys. Like, sure, welcome. Number three. A significant investment in design is usually made at some point. This is where I entered BBVA. They had come to the realization that design was important. They're a bank, but years ago, they were already thinking 
that their competitors were not the other banks. They were Google and Apple. Super forward thinking. And to compete with Google and Apple, you need design. Design thinking permeated into your organization. Number four, design starts to be distributed into the organization through designers. And then that magic comes at number five, where design becomes infused. And that's where everybody, regardless of their role, starts to think about the customer, starts to think about uh, more creative ways to solve problems, and uh, collaborates more. So think about, think about where you are on a spectrum that hopefully you've burned into your brain. Now, who needs slides with us? Ah, good. So when I started, as I said, BBVA, they had done a few sporadic design projects, started to see the value, they were making an investment, and I came to BBVA, you might have, might have noticed I'm not Spanish. Uh, I come from the United States, and I worked at a design consultancy in San Francisco. One day we showed up for work, and they said, surprise, we've been purchased by BBVA. We, we all had to Google BBVA. Because <laughs> they're not present in California, where I'm from. So we were relieved with this idea that our competitors were not the other banks. They were Google and Apple. So we knew we were in a very forward-looking company, which made a big difference. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the business case for design. I think the fact that you're all here may mean that you already know this. Now, design is good business. And Steve Jobs said it best that design, the word, is a little bit misleading because it makes it sound like it's about how things look. The color of this bag, the fonts, all that was design. The kind of design that we're talking about here is different. It's about how do things work. You need to look under the covers, under the hood of the car, and see how things work, and use that as your starting point. And it's amazing, Steve said this over 20 years ago, and the message is still sinking in into business. So IBM, GE, Intuit, they are all on a road similar to BBVA now. They are hiring, purchasing, finding thousands of designers. Two years ago, I and, G, uh, and GE both said, we're going to hire a thousand designers. And everybody's like, ah, oh, come on. They've actually, they're nearly at over 2,000, those two companies. And they've homegrown thousands more of these hybrids. Uh, design consultancies are now, they're all internal. Now they're complicated. And last, Cooper, who was just recently purchased. The Spring Studio, purchased by BBVA. So it's another path to bringing design into the organization. And this is why. Design-infused companies are over 200 times more profitable than their non-design-infused S&P peers. That is super significant. So there's, there's something here. Now, what it is, is it's innovation. And that's what we've been talking about all morning. And design is particularly good at innovation. It's not the only way to innovate, but it's a proven recipe for innovation. And like the speakers this morning said, this is about being different, thinking differently, doing things differently. And design is good at that. So it's also good at meeting the human needs that we've been talking about. I didn't use the user word. Uh, for me, it goes way back, and, and yeah, drugs are the other place, <laughs> the other industry that uses it. But design and design thinking has been proven to lower costs. It's been proven to reduce market risk. It's been proven to increase efficiency and to increase engagement. And here, I don't just mean customer engagement. I mean employee engagement. When people start working this way, they go from sort of the walking dead where they're, they're not engaged, and they come out and they're excited and empowered. And that is worth millions and millions of dollars to any company. So who's familiar with this curve? Anybody ever seen this before? What is it? It's what? 
the life and death cycle of a product, a market, even a human life. Start, you've got this little kind of hook, period of incubation, rapid growth, but then something happens. If you're a human, we just get older. Uh, the world around us changes. Now, if you're a product, other products come into the market. Competition, things change, user tastes change. Something happens, and if you just stay the same, you're going to go into that inevitable decline. And a lot of people think, this is it. You can't cheat it. But you can. Just keep innovating. And continuous innovation is the key to cheat death in our products, our businesses, and our markets. So by continuously innovating, we're able to stay ahead and stay competitive. If you stand still, that's it. Everybody passes you by. So the key to innovation are these little, I call them innovation wells, those little investment hooks. And that's where design lives. That's where it lives. And design answers the who, who are we designing for, the why, what do they need, what problem are we really solving for? And then finally, the what. What's the solution to the user, ah, there I go, to the customer or human being's problem? And once we know the answer to those three questions, the who, the what, and the why, then Agile comes in and Agile's out. Agile gets it done fast. So design and Agile are buddies. They should be married. They, they belong together, and each one is weaker than the other. Design has a tendency to churn, not really get things done. We, we don't build things that much. At least we build models. But to get it out into customers' hands, we need developers. Developers, on the other hand, they're great at building stuff, but they don't often stop to think about this why, who, what. And design can give you guys the tools to do that. So together, design and agile. Now, the reason design is so good at this innovation thing is because there are a few superpowers, that I call them. And the first one is that design is human-centered. We're always thinking about the people. Who's in the center? Who are we solving for? What are their needs? What are their dreams, their aspirations? We put them there at the beginning, and we keep throughout the whole process. So that's the most important thing to remember about design, human-centered superpower. Collaborative. We deal with really complex problems. The bigger the problem, the more complex, and the more heads we need to solve it. More disciplines and areas of expertise that come together, work together effectively to solve problems, the better the solution, the faster the solution. Design thinking, tool set specifically designed for collaboration. You guys use Post-its to see it. So do we, and Post-its are really good at that. We're visual. And that visual feature of design and design thinking helps people stay on the same page, come together, and solve complex problems. Number three, design thinking is experimental. We have baked failure into the process. Because failure is inevitable. If you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. So think of your ideas, your solutions to customers' problems as hypotheses. It's a hypothesis that needs to be tested. And so we create experiments to test our ideas. And then finally, design thinking is validated, we're measuring all the time, and we iterate. So the process just continuing and continuing, better, better, better each time. We have a saying, you should fall in love with your problem, not your solution. Once you fall in love with that solution, you're like, oh my god, I love you, it's the best idea ever, the customers are going to love it, you stop. You stop thinking, you stop innovating, you stop improving. So if you love your problem, you're always looking for another solution to that problem that's going to be even better. So love your problems. Now, design thinking has a lot of different ways of doing it.
it. Uh, some of them are branded, they're out there. To me, that's not important. The process is essentially the same across all of these different models. At BBVA, we have a four-step model. It starts with understanding, we do research, we understand our customer, what problem they're facing, and what problem are we trying to solve? Because often, somebody will come to us and say, here's a problem, once we start to dig and we do our research, we realize ah, that's not actually the problem. The problem's way over here. And that's the most important thing. Because if you start down the road of solving one problem, your problem is really over there, you're going to get all the way down the road and you're not going to be in the right place. So knowing what problem you're trying to solve. Number two, we ideate. We come together, we put together as many ideas as we can, we form a competition of ideas, and the best ideas win out. Number three, we create a prototype, which is our testable model. That's our experiment to see if those ideas that won, are they really good? And that's where evaluation and testing come. And then we repeat, repeat, repeat. So design business and technology. And good products, they actually live in the middle. Design without business, can't get things done. Design without technology, again, can't think, get things done. Business and technology without design may not be solving the user's needs. So all three of these need one another, and they're crucial. Now, we've been mostly talking about products and services. We all work for companies, and Everybody, there's a, almost an established wisdom now that you need design to create amazing products and services, right? That's where design lives. Products and services. I don't think so. We've been fighting for 20, 30 years now, or my age, to get a seat at the table. A bigger seat at the product and service table. And once I joined EBBA, I started to realize, here's another table not the only table. There is an organizational table. It sits behind the products and services. The whole organization that's enabling this machine to run and create amazing products and services. Procurement, risk, legal, facilities, human resources. All of these teams that are not directly engaged in the product and service pipeline have tremendous power over that pipeline, indirect power. And when you think about, in a case like BBVA, 132,000 people, everybody all day long, five days a week, making decisions. Some of those people, most of them, don't ever even see a customer. But their decisions are impacting the customer experience in indirect ways. Now, what if we lived in a world where everybody was thinking about the customer, regardless of their, their, uh, their access to the product and service pipeline? And that's what we're starting to do at BBVA. So the organization, we're starting with processes, mindsets, behaviors, norms, ultimately culture. And that's where we're going to spend the rest of the talk, on this organizational side. Product and service side, that's five other books that I could write about that, and I think you guys probably know a lot about that. This other table, this is interesting, because it's been, for design, it's been behind the curtain, and we haven't really thought about it, and it's a super interesting place. So, what I'm going to propose to you is a design-driven approach to organizational change. Now, organizational change is not new. We, we think about, okay, we've got to change BBBA as bank. It's very threatened. Still is. Banks are all threatened right now. And that is a high motivator. Now, we need to go through a big transformation, but think about this idea that back to that curve, you stop moving, the market passes by. Competitors keep moving. So we're always in change. Change is actually a constant. So think of this not as we're only going to apply it when we need to go through a big, big transformation. Apply it day to day. Think about it that way. So there is a lot of established wisdom there. Uh, according to Kendi, 
25,000 books have been written about organizational change. Now, John Cotter is, is one of the greats in this field. He's been at it for 40 years at Harvard. He's got an eight-step model. And when we sat down at BBA, we thought, okay, what do we do here? We, got, we bought Cotter's books. We got a whole big stack of them. We said, everybody on the team, read this book. And so we got step number one, create urgency. We had that. The bank was in trouble. <laughs> step number two, form a powerful coalition. That was happening. Even the purchase of Spring Studio proved that. Number three, create a vision for change. It's been really a top down. Or communicate that vision. So far, so good. Remove obstacles. Create short term wins. I love it. Build on change. Anchor change in culture. That's where my brain came to a screeching halt. Why is culture last? And everybody said, of course it's last. It's the hardest thing. It's last. Do everything else, and then you do culture. And, and that bugged me. So I went over and I checked out McKenzie. And McKenzie, similar model. Uh, set your strategic objectives. Good. Assess current capabilities. Good. Good. Create a portfolio of initiatives. Yeah, implementation model, and then sustain it. Keep going. Good. Pretty good. There's something still wrong. So here's the problem. 25,000 books, awesome models, but this fact is true. And I've seen statistics that it's up to 70%. 70. So I think we need more books or something. Something is not right here. So. Think about those paradigms. A few things. First, they always begin with the organizational needs, and they apply them to the problem. What does that remind you of? We heard it this morning. So businesses often start with business needs and apply them to the customers. We know that doesn't always work. Often, the business needs, if we start there, don't correspond to the customer needs. Starting with the customer needs, extrapolating back to the business, then you can have success and you meet your business needs. So that idea of starting with the organization and pushing it to people, that was contrary to design thinking, the designer movement. The strategy was very top-down and leadership-driven, driven from the top. We have 132,000 people. Carlos Torres is one guy. You can't run 132,000 people in all these countries. So we needed something more distributed. The implementation dynamic is very linear. And I think Alan said it this morning, you don't know what you don't know. So if I'm planning step 8.2.3, I don't know if that's really the right step. But planning too far in advance. Focus is on process and efficiency. Not very human. Quantitative measurement. We'll talk about that later. And then failure is an accident. We don't want that. We don't want failure, so we're not going to plan for it. It's not going to happen. If we plan hard enough, it won't happen. So we are going to turn that on, on its head. Every single one of those tenants we flipped at BBBA. So we started an assumption that there was going to be a gap between the leadership vision and the employee capacity. We knew what was there. So what we did is we started with research, as design thinking should, to understand what problem are we really facing here. So every company has a vision. They have a mission. Different companies, different missions. Google provide access to the world's information with one click. BBBA. Bring the age of opportunity to everyone. Volkswagen, globally leading provider of sustainable mobility. Now, these are lofty goals and they're abstract. So, how are these, how do you action on these? This is our first alignment. So, that leadership vision, the employee capacity or the employee needs to execute the vision, it's a gap. Now, that gap can be filled with all kinds of problems. 
You need to open up the hood and look in that gap and see what's there. Now, it could be a skill gap. It could be communication disconnects. It could be internal politics. All kinds of things can be in that gap. If we looked under the hood at BBVA, we saw three things. We saw that many of those 132,000 people were removed from the customer. We saw that they were silos. Big corporations, they're machines. And to move fast, there's often a lot of siloing. And then finally, we, we observed a business as usual mindset. And by that, we mean that's how we've always done it. We've always done it this way, 160 years. We don't need to change, except the world has completely changed their mind. So we set out to solve those three challenges that we had specifically identified. And for remove from the customer, we wanted to foster Siloed, we wanted to build bridges for collaboration and have a business as usual mindset. We wanted to give people tools to start to creatively solve problems. So that brings us to steps two and three. And I put these together because they happen simultaneously for us. And step two and three, step two, empower employees with the needed capabilities. Step three, create local leaders that will create pockets for what? Culture change. So in this model, culture change is not step eight, step two and a half. Because culture is not a monolith. It's not one thing. It's pockets. So what we wanted to do was start to create pockets of culture that would ultimately be the little stones that led to something bigger. So to accomplish those goals, we started to look at different models. We looked at what other companies were doing. And strategy A, you create an online course. It's an hour long, two hours maybe. Everybody in the company takes it. And then you really, you're there, right? Wrong. The change in mindset and behavior is so marginal that it's just chipping away at the edges. These are our little organizational features, by the way, that we're experimenting. Now, strategy B, this is a very common one as well. Let's just train the scrum teams, just the product and service pipeline. That's all we need. The rest of the people, they don't matter. But again, you're leaving most of the organization. So strategy three was, was a little bit different. We went with a scattershot where we identified individuals or, or pairs or groups all across the organization, and we gave them very, very deep training. Four full days, four nine-hour days, 200-page uh, manual in design thinking, tools, facilitation cards, all of these tools for them to start working differently. And the idea was we would give them the training, and they would become change agents. We would create a little army of change agents all the way through the EDA. And they would go back to their areas and create these micro-communities, these pockets, of culture And what we asked of them was to initiate behavior change, to start to interact with their customers. Some of the time, the customers were outside the bank. Sometimes they were other businesses. Sometimes they were all within the bank. Everybody has a So we asked them to interact, to connect with other areas, to collaborate. Invite people into the process to experiment with new ideas. Don't follow the thing that's the way we've always been. To prototype and test those concepts, iterate their solutions, and then number, number six, that's the clincher. Pass on what they've learned. And a lot of times they'd be like, oh my God, I can't, I can't run a class. I can't do it. All you have to do is lead by example. So those individuals, they got the training, they went back to their teams, and they started to work differently. And mostly, the most important thing that they did was they asked some questions. Why are we doing it this way? Just that question was enough to start to create a culture shift in their team. So 
These are a few scenes from our, our workshops. We've had upwards of 50 of them in, in 10 countries now and to create 1,100 of these change agents. As I said, we have our manual and all of our materials. And what we were creating were these hybrids. And they're an interesting group. Uh, way behind. Uh, okay, so they're an interesting group because they are something plus design thinker. And we have 1,100 of these weird combinations. Now, some of them make sense. Engineer, designer, et cetera. But we've also got administrative assistants, risk analysts, all of these different people. And I want to tell you three quick stories. Begonia, she is a, an engineer who's involved in security. She was our first ambassador. She went back and she's trained hundreds of people. At first through example, but now she actually does teach courses. The guy in the middle, Javier, he works for our human resources team. He wanted to boost employee engagement. He opened a bread shop in our, our corporate headquarters so that people could buy fresh bread during the day. And then that's Sarah on the end. She's an agile coach. Once she took the course and became an ambassador, she started to integrate design thinking to the way she coached that time. So step four, build strategic partnerships, because you need to start to scale. So scaling is through partnership. And here, you think on the product and service side, natural partners, business, engineering, sales, marketing. Look at this other side, legal, communication, totally different set of stakeholders and partners. Uh, products and services, they're concrete, the timeline is short. On the other side, it's, fun, it's hard to measure, and the time is pretty really long. I don't think it's quite as long as modern. Um, the ways of measuring impact. You have a product, a service, it goes into market, you can measure through sales, all kinds of things. On the other side, we don't have the tools yet to measure. Finally, the role of design is very different on these two sides. Role of design in products and services, strategy and execution. Role of design on the other side, coaching and mentoring. Totally different. So when we finished the ambassador program, it was our four-day intense workshop, we had managed to plug some of that gap. We needed to do more. The next thing we did, we created an executive training, because you need to convince the top. I'm not here to say the top is not important. The leadership vision is. It's the execution of that vision that I'm questioning. We also created easy and on-ramps for people to start to learn about design, events, little booklets, posters, things like that. Then we created master classes for the ambassador to keep improving. And finally, next month, we're launching our express course. So if you think back to those three strategies, we ultimately did all three. And that's what I would advocate. You do all three, the shallow, the targeted, as well as the distributed. It's the choice of what sequence to do it in and where to start. If you want to start with impact. Now, the other thing, you have to coach. Only about 30% of what you learn, you learn in the classroom. The rest of it, you learn by doing. So we needed to create a huge coaching effort to help these people move forward. And we ultimately put together a very complex ecosystem. Step five. This one's really important. Foster capacity to identify and remove organizational obstacles. Now, we had our story. They went out. They did their micro communities. Here's what really happened. They hit roadblocks. The organization pushed back in thousands of little ways. You can't buy the right post-its. You can't put anything on the Lots and lots of little tiny things. And so you think about those top-down models. They're looking for roadblocks from the top looking down. The real roadblocks to innovation are to the sides. Little things that you can't see from the top. This is our analogy. You can't see unless you've got one of these. So what happened was the ambassadors were able to spot these little roadblocks that nobody else saw. In fact, their own team didn't see them. Something's been there a while, you know you're going to walk around it. Our ambassadors came out of classes we told them, oh, work differently, change the bank. They got excited, they went out and they were like, why is this thing? Is that there? What, what are we doing it this way? And those questions, they identified roadblocks that nobody else saw even because it had become so normal. 
that these blocks. So it's been there. It's always been there. We're we're in the process of creating this this uh, draft set of cards. These are roadblock removal cards. We al we also have opportunity cards to accelerate it. And these are basically little recipes to start to remove these tiny roadblocks, so that over time, little by little, the whole organization starts to become more friendly to innovation. Finally, learn and evolve, accept failures, reward what's working, and pivot if you need to. So I want to quickly go through what this paradigm looks like. It begins with human needs, and it extrapolates back to the organization. Strategy is bottom-up, discovery-driven. People are doing it, they're experimenting, and they're learning. Uh, leadership is distributed and organic. Our goal was to create leaders all over the bank, not just a few at the top. Implementation dynamic is experimental. It's not linear. We know we don't know things. Focus is on people and engagement, not process and efficiency. Qualitative plus quantitative, stories of change that we don't know how to measure yet, but we see they're there. Failure is learning, because it's going to happen. So, skip that one. Uh, so, I'll, I'll share the slide deck, but we put together what is actually a circular model, more like design thinking, that we just went through. Now, your organization, I want you to think back to this ratio. Don't be sad if it's a really big difference. Or, don't be sad because you can create this middle ground, this hybrid. And wherever you are here, remember, two and a half years ago, BBBA was down there. Today we're up here. But also remember, this is linear one way. You can slide back. There are companies that started with Design Infused 20, 30 years ago, and now, they're the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs happen fast now. So remember, you have these two sides. Don't just think about products and services. Think about the whole organization that supports that product and service pipeline. Key learnings from BBBA, focus on people, activate the whole organization, share design with everyone. Your designers, some of them will like it, some of them may not, but they'll come to love it. Trigger behavior change. It's not just awareness is great, mindset is great, but you have to, at the end of the day, you have to act differently for things to turn out differently. Create early wins that prove the success of what you're doing. Align, cooperate, and partner with everybody. Invite everybody in. Transformation cannot be owned by any one team. We all have to share it. Find and remove those organizational roadblocks. Let people do it, though. So most of them are too small to be seen by the rest of us. Measure and report. Get baselines before you start this project. Keep learning and evolving. Because your design team may look like this. That's what ours, ours is at. You need a microscope. But your design impact can look like this. So, how many? 30 seconds for questions? Huh? One minute. Become your uh, ambassador, and uh, you know, try to convince people who are otherwise not willing to be convinced. What is in it for them? A lot, uh, and it's different for everybody. So.